Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the launch of the Beekeeper of Aleppo by Christy Lefteri. Um, we're hosting this launch live on Facebook, so feel free to join us and leave your question in the comments. Um, if you don't have a Facebook account, you can also tweet your questions to us at um, readinglist.click with an underscore if you're on Twitter. But if you search for the reading list, it should come up. Um, joining me today is Efemia Chela and Christy Lefteri, whose book we are launching. Efemia will be in conversation with Christy, so that should be great. And I will remove myself once I've done introductions so everyone can get on with the fascinating conversation. Um, Efemia is a Zambian Ghanaian writer, literary critic, and editor. She grew up in England, Ghana, Botswana, and South Africa, and graduated with a BA in, in French politics and classical civilizations from Rhodes University. And is currently doing her MA at WITS, right, Ephemia? Yes. Thank you for that. <laughs> Lost a <of> fire. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I couldn't remember what um, what department you're doing your MA in. It's a- uh, Development what, 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 Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Chicken, Ephemia's first published story was shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2014. She recently, um, co-edited um, Migrations, the 2016 short story Day Africa collection, and she's a contributing editor to the Johannesburg Review of Books. So thank you very much for joining us, Edmia. Thank you. <laughs> um, Christy was uh, brought up in London. Um, she's the child of Cypriot refugees. She's a lecturer in creative writing at Brunel University. Um, she's the author of the novel A Watermelon, A Fish and a Bible, which was published in 2010 and the best-selling The Beekeeper of Aleppo, which is the book that we're reading this evening and discussing this, this evening. Um, that book was born out of her time working as a volunteer at a UNICEF-supported refugee center in Athens. And obviously in South Africa at the moment, we cannot buy physical hard copies, but the book is available as an ebook on all the platforms that you use for your ebooks. So download it. Lucky Ephemia has a hard copy already. Very lucky. Um, lockdown finishes, if you can. If you can you can buy the ebook now and then support your local indie bookshop once they open up again because they're really going to need our support i think so that would be great and i'm now going to hand over it to ephemia to get the conversation started and i'm going to remove myself from the stream so enjoy everyone thanks, thanks hi christy hi. thank you nice to see you nice to meet you yes nice to meet you how are you doing where are you coming to us from london Lovely. Mm -hmm. I think it's very sunny over there. It is very stormy over here. So an evening of contrasts. I know. I've heard you're in the middle of a storm. And you can see I've got really nice sunshine coming in, which is unusual in <laughs> London. But we, strangely, now that we're in lockdown, we've had beautiful weather. Oh, just to tempt you. <laughs> which I don't think we've had for a few years. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's a lockdown. Let's bring out some sun, but we can't go out. So. It's like, oh, yeah, I know. It's it's definitely a difficult time. But one thing I really enjoyed being inside was reading your book, The Beekeeper of Aleppo. I absolutely loved it. Um, it really resonated with me as a reader, as an immigrant, as a critic. And thanks for agreeing to chat to me this evening. Well, thanks um, for having me. So let's get into it, I suppose. Um, your book is about two people in the face of exceptional circumstances. Nuri is a beekeeper and his wife Afra is an artist and they have a beautiful life in Aleppo and a very intimate relationship before the war breaks out and takes everything away from them. Um, they're then forced to travel across the world and try and reunite with Nuri's business partner and family member all the way in the UK. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about um, how your upbringing um, informed your writing of this novel. Sure, yeah, so Jennifer mentioned that my parents were refugees. Um, so um, my mum and my dad were both refugees um, after the war in Cyprus in 1974. So okay. they, they settled in London. So my dad was an officer of that war and um, my mum was a refugee and they, they actually met in London. Oh wow. Um, yeah, so they, they, had to, they had to make their own journey and find a way to int integrate into the society here in London. Um, and I guess that um, even though I haven't been through a war, you you sort of, as I, as I was growing up, I think without realizing it, or I did realize after, you're, you, you kind of live in the shadow of that trauma or the shadow of mm. that war. 
Um, and so anyway, my, my parents were here for many, many years. And then after my mum passed away, um, my dad decided to go back to Cyprus. And um, I went to visit him. I, I go often to visit him, but it was the Easter of 2016. And okay. he he lives on the far east side of Cyprus that faces Syria. And um, I remember just kind of sitting on the beach and looking out, it's such a beautiful beach there, um, mm. looking out and thinking, if I got on a little boat and just traveled for about an hour or so, maybe a bit longer, I'd end up in Syria. It was so close. Oh, wow. So, and I thought, I'm so safe here on this shore in Cyprus. And yet there's this awful oh, war going on. And at the same time, I, um, if I travelled up north a little bit further, I would eventually, I would eventually reach the green line that divides the island. Yes, of course. So where I was sitting, thinking, "Well, look, here I am, looking out across the water, wondering what's happening to these children and these people. That, that some of them are getting killed, some of them are displaced, they're losing their loved ones." At the same time, I thought maybe. In 1974, they might have been on that side looking out across the water yeah. and thinking the same about my parents and my grandparents and my aunties and my uncles. So a thought like that kind of, you know, it, it, it brings us together across borders and across time. And, yeah. you know, and I realised, you know, how universal these traumas are, even though each war is so different. Um, and there was something about that moment on the beach that really compelled me to want to do something. And obviously I couldn't go to Syria, so I decided that one thing that I could do, because I, I speak Greek, I thought, well, I can go to Greece and maybe oh, yeah. maybe do some voluntary work there. So it was, it was sort of that connection, that day at the beach, thinking about what was going on, the devastation. It was, I mean, it was, what I was trying to imagine was so bad that I almost couldn't even imagine. Yeah. Um, so there was something about my my own background, my parents' background, knowing what my family had been through, being displaced themselves, um, the fact that my dad himself was an officer of that war. You know, all this kind of came together made me want to go and volunteer, and then from there, that's that's the whole. Yeah. You know. how it continued yeah. I, I always find it so interesting when you talk to writers and artists about before you're born how much is put in motion and, and how much almost it leads you up into this point where you sort of realize this is what I'm here for this is what I need to do now yeah which I always find so interesting um fascinating yeah I'm, I'm really interested in things like that I've, I actually wrote an article for the observer uh what was it about a year ago about transgenerational trauma and how trauma mm -hmm. can be heard from one generation to the next, yeah. especially when those traumas aren't spoken about. Um, so it can kind of come through in a silent way. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. My, my mum is Ghanaian and she had to leave um, Ghana because there was a, a dictator at the time. And right. she's never discussed it and she will never discuss it. She just says, that's something I can't talk about. But it's always been something that's always been very present in my own childhood. And has definitely kind of shaped me in a way. It's very yeah. fascinating. That's it, isn't it? It's present, but it's it's silent, which yeah. is really interesting. But then, you know, after I published this book, when I was writing this article, I remember that I did actually, I was going for a walk while I was writing the article. And mm. as I was walking, my dad happened to phone me and he asked me what I was doing. And I said, oh, I'm writing this article and it's about transgenerational trauma. And I told him what it was. And then for probably the first time that I can remember, he started talking about that war which oh. I really heard. And he did say that he didn't want to talk about it when I was young because he was trying to protect me. So I guess sometimes our parents, sometimes they silence themselves in a way to protect the next generation from... Yeah, to kind of seal it off. I can exactly. definitely understand that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting you're talking about relationships. One thing I really felt in here was that um, in The Beekeeper of Aleppo, Nuri and Afra have this very intimate relationship. Um, Afra in the novel goes blind because of a very traumatic event, which I won't spoil for you, but um, she can still tell Nori's mood. She can still feel where he is. Um, he'll walk into a room and just by, you know, the cast of his breath, she'll be able to say what's wrong. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how you chose the characters of Nori and Afra and 
if that was directly linked to your time when you were volunteering. Yeah, that's interesting because so so I'll start by saying how the characters came to life in my mind. So um, when I got to Athens, I was working in a women and children's centre. So oh. it was a, a centre where women, in, it was a safe place for women and children. They were coming from the nearby camps. So one mm. of the camps was Elenigo, which was the old airport. There was another camp at the old school, Bedion Duareos, which was in the park, which I've mentioned in my oh, yes. novel, yeah. Um, so there were various duties that we had and we, we used to rotate. It was really hectic in that first year because it was a drop-in centre. So I, I would either be on the tin biscuits area, we didn't have a food licence, so it was tin biscuits, but those tin biscuits became so, so important because it, was a, it wasn't just that they were getting something to eat and also something to drink. It was mm. also the routine that we developed and, and also kind of getting to know people that way. So mm. I'd get to know who wanted the chocolate biscuits, who wanted the plain biscuits, who, who yeah. wanted milk in their tea, who didn't want milk in their tea, that sort of thing. And also the women developed friendships there, which was really important. It was really yeah. important in the development of friendships, a place to sit and be safe. We also had um, showers, so people could come and have warm showers because there weren't showers at the camps. Um, there was a play area for children. And there was also um, an area for new mothers that had just given birth. So we had a sofa. Wow. So they could sit there and breastfeed and we could hold their babies while they had a shower or, you know, a rest, whatever. So this place was really important to them and they'd come every day. And at that time, I was just whizzing around. I, I didn't even have time to <laughs> I remember yeah. I, I put up one Facebook post and I said, you know, what's going on here and the camps are dire and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'll post again. And I didn't because I was I was so exhausted. So exactly. I just didn't have the energy. But I kept getting a picture in my mind of um, so I wasn't I wasn't asking people questions because it was a safe place for them in the centre. Mm. But ever since I was a little girl, whenever I get a bit overwhelmed emotionally about something my first instinct has always been to write so oh. i remember thinking well, maybe i might want to write about this so i will get to your question <laughs> i am heading there oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I thought, yeah i thought maybe i might want to write about this so i started to talk to people in the square mm. to work so i would say to them i might write something would you be willing to share your story with me and everyone that could speak english that i asked they wanted mm -hmm. to talk, they wanted to share their stories. And then there were some stories that came silently, like this man who um, who was cutting his wrists and he lost his voice, he couldn't speak. And he would hold um, a photograph of his mother and his two brothers every mm -hmm. day. And I, someone else told me that he'd lost them in the war. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I think probably like, a few weeks later, someone told me that eventually he could speak and say, I miss you to the people in the photograph. So th these these um, situations I was absorbing without realising. And mm. then I suddenly got this kind of image in my mind of, it was just a picture, like a still picture of a woman and a man. I didn't know their names. Um, she was blind. I knew that they had just lost their son. And he'd come in from the streets, their house was crumbling, and he was holding a pomegranate, and it was a gift for her. And that, mm. that was the image I had while I was in Greece. And it wasn't until I came back to the UK that that image started to move, and those characters started to come to life. And then I gave them names, and then they, they just started to kind of develop a character. And, and, and so I thought, well, let me write the beginning of the story. So I wrote the beginning and then it just kind of grew from there. So they mm. weren't based on anyone that I met, but somehow the experience of being in Athens created this image in my mind. And then, yeah. you know, so it was an, it was like an accumulation of everything. Yeah, it was very cumulative and, and quite natural for you, it sounds like. Yeah, it was, definitely. Um, I was wondering if you could actually read a little bit for us um, oh, sure. yeah. for our viewers and listeners. So I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning. So at the beginning of the story, we already know that Nuri and Afra, it's not right at the beginning, it's a few pages. Mm. And we already know that they've made it to the, to the UK um, 
by the coast and they're in a B&B. So I'm gonna read a little bit from there. This is Nuri speaking, so just imagine a man's voice. Um, I'm glad Afra can't see this place. She would like the seagulls though, the crazy way they fly. In Aleppo, we're far from the sea. I'm sure she would like to see these birds and maybe even the coast because she was raised by the sea. Well, I am from Eastern Aleppo where the city meets the desert. When we got married and she came to live with me, Afra missed the sea so much that she started to paint water wherever she found it. Throughout the arid plateau region of Syria, there are oases and streams and rivers that empty into swamps and small lakes. Before we had Sami, we would follow the water and she would paint it in oils. There is one painting of the quake I wish I could see again. She made the river look like a storm water drain running through the city park. Afra had this way of seeing truth in landscapes. The painting and its measly river reminds me of struggling to stay alive. Mm. 30 or so kilometers south of Aleppo, the river gives up the struggle of the harsh Syrian steppe and evaporates into the marshes. I'm scared of her eyes, but these damp walls and the whys in the ceiling and the billboards, I'm not sure how she would deal with all this if she could see it. The billboard just outside says that there are too many of us, that this island will break under our weight. I'm glad she's blind. I know what that sounds like. If I could give her a key that opened a door into another world, then I would wish for her to see again. But it would have to be a world very different from this one, a place where the sun is just rising, touching the walls around the ancient city, and outside those walls, the starlight quarters and the houses and apartments and hotels and narrow alleys and open air market where a thousand hanging necklaces shine with that first light. And further away, across the desert land, gold on gold and red on red. Sammy would be there, smiling and running along those alleys with his scuffed trainers, change in his hand, on the way to the store to get milk. I try not to think about Sam. I'll leave it there. Thank you. That's given us a wonderful taste of your use of language and also the way that you world build. I found that it was just so immersive. You know, I really felt like I was seeing Syria through the eyes of people who lived there before the devastation. And I was wondering what your research process was like when you were doing the book, because obviously you couldn't go there. No, but this is, it was a huge process, huge process. So what happened was that when I got back to the UK, the first year in 2016, um, I decided to learn Arabic, or I tried anyway, oh. right? So I found a tutor, Ibrahim, um, who's a fantastic tutor if anyone wanted to <laughs> Arabic. You know, let us know, everyone in the comments. Ibrahim Otman, he's a brilliant, brilliant tutor. So I found him and we would meet up at Euston Station for a, a year and actually more than a year because even after I went back and I came back, the lessons continued. So we would meet up for an hour and a half every single week on a Wednesday. And um, we would, so once he realized what I was doing and that I wanted to write this book, um, he, what we did is we did 45 minutes of Arabic a week and then 45 minutes of going through the manuscript. Oh, wow, okay. So Ibrahim was also a translator for boys that were going through a, their asylum process. Oh. So, um, and he was also from Aleppo. So I learned a hell of a lot from Ibrahim. Yeah. A hell of a lot, you know, I learned about Aleppo before the war. I learned, there were certain things that I could, you know, like I'll give you an example. So there's a bit where my characters have to go from um, Aleppo to the Turkish border. Oh yes, yeah, I remember that. So that was, to me, I almost gave up writing the book at that point, because I thought, well, how am I going to do this? It's not as if I can go. And I thought, well, I can't do it. It's it's not possible. So what, what I did with Ibrahim is that he got the map out on Google. And he said to me, right, where are your characters? Where do you want them to get to? And so we went through street by street. And he would tell me they could go left here, right here. They could go down there. Uh -huh. And I would say, now, because Cyprus is so near, so I was trying to use Cyprus as a, as a kind of, foundation to help me to understand oh, yeah. uh, you know the weather that sort of thing so I would I would say to him well, what's the what kind of vegetation what are the trees like 
what does the soil smell like? What what's this like? What what kind of flowers grow here mm. this time of year? What about that time of year? So, for example, in in Cyprus, if you're driving along, there's such a strong smell of jasmine sometimes. So, ah. I, you know, so I'd say to him, well, does that happen? In, is that you know, is that is that something? Yeah. And also the lemon trees, and then and then the other thing we get in Cyprus is that sometimes there are dust storms, desert storms that come from Syria and Egypt. And it changes, oh. it changes the color of the sky. It kind of goes like a slight purpley color. Oh yeah, yeah. You can actually smell the desert. So then I, I would, with Abraham and I would have these discussions, and that would help me to have a grounding and a basis. Mm. And also, once I got to sort of like, um, you know, I was reading out the manuscript to him every week to make sure that it was authentic and i was going to syrian breakfasts with him in acton in london Ooh, well i say breakfast but it was a feast you know <laughs> it was it was more like dinner it was just it was amazing so i got to try all these beautiful foods mm -hmm. and you know so there were a few times where i went to these breakfasts with him so this was ongoing weekly research and help um, which I couldn't have done without Ibrahim, really. Uh, mm. I just happened to find the right person because I could have found a tutor that wasn't from Aleppo. That well, was, that's yeah. You know? And then when I was doing the asylum interview section, when Nuri and Afra go for their asylum interview, um, yeah. um, Ibrahim helped me to understand um, what kind of questions they would be asked. Mm. I won't give too much away because that's later in the story, but for the... For those that are going to read it, you'll see that there's a specific way that questions are asked and they're quite unusual. It's quite an unusual mm. method. Um, so I learned so much from, from those one and a half hour sessions I was having with Ibrahim on a weekly basis. And also I was reading reading the news, reading yeah, the history of Syria, reading, reading people's stories and interviewing people as well. So when I came to the UK, I was still interviewing. I set it in Brighton, um, the B&B, &B, because the first person I interviewed in the UK, okay, this man called Elias, was, was staying in Brighton and he was waiting for his family to be able to come to the UK as well. Aha, okay. It sounds like it was a very, uh, a very in-depth process, but also a, quite a glorious, very generative process that you went through. Yeah, it was uh, difficult. It was difficult. And, you know, sometimes I'd have to say to Ibrahim, are you all right? Do you want to talk about, you know, because I could see that he was kind of getting upset, you know, that sort of thing sometimes. But, you know, it's one of those things that it's like what we were talking about before. Do we, do we silence? Do we speak about these yeah. things? You know, when, when I was talking about my own parents as well. Mm. So it was, it got me thinking a lot about what my parents as well would have experienced as refugees, what they would have felt, what, you know, I remember when I was working in the camps, I was like, you know, you kind of, you think, oh, what what situation would they have been in? What, what you know, mm -hmm. all these things were in my mind the whole time that I was researching and writing. Yeah, I, mean, I think that definitely comes through. There's one of the interesting things I find about the book particularly is there's this really powerful metaphor of bees um, mm. in the book. And bees have always been in lots of different strands of mythology, um, sacred insects, because they are often thought to bridge the natural world to the underworld. And especially in a world where bees are becoming more scarce and they're so integral to our ecosystems, I found it to be a very interesting metaphor of having Nuri being this beekeeper and also have them traveling across large distances like bees did. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about the role of bees in the book. Sure, so I, it was weird how that happened because I didn't know what job Nuri was gonna have. And I mm. remember I just woke up one morning and I thought, oh, he's gonna be a beekeeper. <laughs> this felt right, it just suddenly it felt right. And I thought, well, I don't know anything. Well, well I, I need to research. So I started this whole um, process of researching beekeeping in general. Um, mm and also agriculture in Syria, beekeeping in Syria. And as I was researching, I came across an article about a man called Dr. Rial Dalsus, who everyone should look up because he's, he's just amazing. He's one of the, he, he's just, I mean, even now I saw on his Facebook page earlier today that even though everyone's in lockdown, he's making sure that his bees are all right, you know? He's, mm. So um, anyway, so I found this article and this man, 
He was a professor of um, agriculture at Damascus University. And oh. he, yeah, so he, and also he kept apiaries. Um, mm. So he was making honey and all sorts of, so um, he came to the UK as a refugee and managed to settle in Huddersfield, which is in the north of England. Mm. So I thought, well, I have to contact him because this man just sounds fascinating and he's yeah. just so brave and courageous. To, to So he set up a project called the Buzz Project in Huddersfield, where he teaches refugees and job seekers how to keep bees. Oh, wow. Right. So I went onto his Facebook page. I sent him a Facebook and I said, this is what I'm doing. I'm writing this novel. This is why I'm writing it. Um, I find you fascinating. What you're doing is wonderful. Um, I hope that you contact me. And he did. He contacted me. I think it was the next day. And he said, how wow. are you going to talk on the phone? And I said, yeah, that would be lovely. So he phoned me and he called me my dear Christy right from the start. My dearest oh. Christy, which is why Mustafa calls Nuri that in the book. Because it can remind <laughs> Riyadh. So he invited me to go up to Huddersfield and to meet him, his family, and the bees. Mm. And so I went. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, I went with a friend of mine. Um, and so me and my friend Maria, we went up to, we traveled up to Huddersfield to meet Riyadh and his wife and his son and, um, and to meet the bees. And I remember when we got there, um, he said to me, well, I have, we're going to go and visit the apiaries, but there's also um, beehives in the garden. So I think there were about five beehives in the garden. But oh, his own garden? His own garden. But he said, I don't have protective gear for the beehives in the garden. But he said, don't worry, it will be fine. So I thought, well, I'm just going to do it, even though I was a bit scared. I thought, I'm just going to go out without protective gear. It's only five beehives, but five beehives... I somehow seem like 20,000 bees. <laughs> well, yeah, there's more. <laughs> and he said to me, so you might recognize this from the story. He said, don't worry, because um, if they get if they get angry, I know. And I said, oh, yes. I said they smell like bananas. And then I, the whole time I was standing there, because he told me to put my hand over my eyes like this and stand really still. That's so that the bees don't sting your eyes. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, Stand really still, and the whole time I was thinking, I swear I can smell bananas. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like one creature that you can run away from. They no, just, they're a whole swarm. But he's so trustworthy. So I just thought, relax and enjoy this and trust him. Mm. So I took a deep breath and I really saw sort of, the smell, the sound of the bees, feeling so vulnerable with all these bees kind of flying mm. around you. And it was such a lovely, it was like being in a kind of dangerous, beautiful bubble. Mm. Um, and so I then, with you know, that experience of meeting the bees for the first time, I used it in my novel when Nuri goes to meet the bees, when Mustafa introduces him to the bees yes. younger. But then we went to the apiaries and that's where Riyadh was teaching me about the bees and how they communicate with one another. Mm -hmm about how he raises queen bees. And there in the apiaries, there were there were loads and loads of beehives. So we had our protective gear on and he'd wow. open the trays and he'd show us how he did things. And then, you know, we had like so many questions to ask him. I learned so much from Riyadh. So the research that I had done beforehand then just came to life in front of me with okay. everything yeah. that was teaching me. So it was a real hands-on experience. It was lovely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that you could probably be a city planner as, and a, a beekeeper as well. Um, <laughs> I definitely couldn't do it. I, I'm not practical to do things. <laughs> Something would be wrong. Yeah, it's interesting. I was when um, I lived in the south of France for a bit and I was involved with a guy whose dad was a beekeeper. Oh, right. um, and he um, and I, I love bees. I have a bee tattoo as well. Um, oh. and, um, where is it? Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's on my arm. I don't know if the camera's going to be able to see it. I don't think so. It's sort of an awkward place. It's like in the crook of my elbow. But mm -hmm. um, I remember one day I was in a very, very, I always used to help them with the bees, but it was, it was French beekeeping, which is every culture has its own way of beekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. The principles are the same, but the huts are different. And they have these old artisanal wooden huts. And we, I used to spend ages dragging these huts towards the chestnut trees to make chestnut honey or, you know, into different fields, to make a different wow. kind of... I remember one day I came and I was in a really, really bad mood. 
Um, and his father and him turned me away. They were like, no, you can't. The bees will be able to sense it. And they can. That's they're very, amazing. Right. They're very, very, very sensitive. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Um, yeah. What and that was you had. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was. It was. It was wonderful. It was just really weird. I mean, it, I think very few people ever meet beekeepers, but they're, it's such an interesting mixture of agriculture and art and science. It's, it's incredible. It is incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Um, and then I wanted to ask you a bit about how different this was to working on your first novel and how you think you've grown as a writer since then. Because your first novel was in um, 2010, I think? Yeah, 2011. Yeah, 20, yeah, one of the two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should know that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've grown a lot as a writer and I've grown a lot in the way that I research as well. And, you know, I've been teaching creative writing for a lot longer as well and that teaches me a lot too. But, you know, I, I can see how I've grown as a person between mm -hmm. my first book and this book. So between... Um, a watermelon a fish in a Bible and the beekeeper of Aleppo I had you know my mum died I went through a divorce so there were lots of personal things but also I was doing a psychoanalytic training point which was, which I then decided I didn't want to pursue as a career um, but but for a while I was working as an honorary psychotherapist in a hospital in Westminster which meant I worked a lot with people that suffered from trauma and all sorts oh. of um, and so all those experiences helped me, I think, to grow as a person and therefore to grow as a writer. Okay. I think when you're writing, it's to do with perception as well and how you're seeing the world and what you understand about people and people's reactions to things. So the more you grow up, I suppose, the, the I suppose I can see in my yeah. writing that I've grown up, I've grown up from one book to the other and I've accumulated these experiences that have changed my writing as well as me yeah i think that's very true i suppose and i, I suppose um are you keeping up a creative practice in this trying times and do you have any advice for any young budding writers who are trying to make a go of it during various stages of lockdown mm -hmm. yeah no i am writing so i am mm -hmm. writing i try i mean i try to write every day but then when it comes to the weekend I think, well, it's the weekend. I know it doesn't make any difference because we might as well just, you know, every day is just a day. I mean, I don't, it's often the, but, but when it comes to the weekend, I say, right, I'm, I'm going to have a little bit of a break from it to give my mind a rest from it. The advice that I give to people, now I don't keep a routine. I don't, I'm not going to wake up at nine and say so I'm going to work from this time to this time. Although mm -hmm. I did the beekeeper when I was in Athens because I had to. In the second year when I went back to Athens, mm -hmm. I was writing from 9.30 in the morning until five every day because I promised myself that I wasn't going to leave Athens until I wrote the whole bit in Athens. So the okay. whole thing was a challenge. Yeah. So, um, but normally I just allow myself a bit of freedom during the day, especially now that I can, that we're on lockdown. But the advice I give to people that want to write is read a lot. Yeah, it's the best advice. I do. I do. This. Really, it really is. Read a lot and read widely, mm. um, and read contemporary stuff and older stuff and things that you wouldn't normally read. And it's. it's it's almost like, I think reading's all about, it's almost like absorbing vitamins in a way. It's like nourishing yourself. That's nice to say. And also um, research. So even if you're writing about London, you think, well, I know London. Well, you mm. might do, and that that natural knowledge will come through the writing. But there's but also reading maybe other people, other writers that have written about London in different ways. Um, so I'm just using London as an, as an example. Mm um or you could you know once the lockdown is over just kind of walk it going to the place that you're writing about if you can go and just immersing yourself in it or if you can go if you can't go like i couldn't go to syria find a way to immerse yourself in it in a different way whatever wh wherever your setting is whatever it is that you're writing about yeah you know if it's if it's a story set in a prison for example and you can't go there are other ways to immerse yourself in it Ooh. So reading and immersing yourself in the, in the place and the topic that you're writing about, those are my two major bits of advice. Thank you. I'm sure everyone listening will appreciate that. I think that's great advice, definitely. Um, I was wondering if Jen could let us know if we had any questions. 
um, in case we do. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, yes. Okay. You're a bit delayed. We've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Oh, am I delayed? A bit. And how's this? It's all okay, right. Well, it's all right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so our first question comes from Asanda. I'll put it on the screen. Can you see that? I'll oh, cool. I'll read it out. Hi, the design is very interesting. Can you talk a bit about how that came about? So the cover design, yeah. The cover also, the, also the interior, I think, and, because I think and it's the, very much an art yeah. object. Well, okay. So, uh, well, I didn't, obviously, I don't design the cover. Um, but I have some say in it. And I think the, the publishers really wanted to kind of, I think the blue, they thought really kind of um, helped to bring out that feeling of hope. Because even though the story is very sad, there's also a lot of hope. So I think the, the, the blue sort of brought that out. And I think that's why they wanted to use the blue. Um, and I mean, I'm, you know, I didn't really have much of a say in how, but I, I was absolutely, blown away, away by the cover and I thought it was beautiful but I didn't have much of a say in the design of it. Um, if we're going to talk about the inside of the book so where each chapter if you notice that like that I don't know if you can see that so the end of one chapter the last word so if I go from the uh, I'm at the end of the first chapter here um, gently um, swings it gently this frozen watch made of bronze and then bronze is the first word of the next chapter bronze was the color of the city far below so i think what's beautiful is they chose a design for the page where that word was and the way i mean i love the design that they chose and i think it added some beauty to it the reason i decided to structure it like that which isn't quite a design i'm talking more about structure is that so after my mum died I remember that I um so people would be talking to me so let's say how you're talking to me you might say something like blah 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 let's have a cup of tea and as soon as you say the word tea for example it would suddenly remind me of having a cup of tea with my mum and even though you would think I was still concentrating on our conversation which I would be to some extent my mind had dropped off somewhere into a memory in in the past with my mum having tea so because Nuri is so traumatized and he's suffered so much loss I thought well a word in the present narrative will trigger his memory so he'll fall into the past so that's why I designed it like that uh, structured it like that and then the publishers chose to add a design on those pages so you'll see that it kind of runs through the book like that it is lovely. I always love a book which is part art object experience and also very literary as well. And I think there's a lovely combination of things in this one. Thank you. That was a lovely question. Thanks. Do we have any more questions, Jim? Ooh. Ooh. Um, I'm not sure if I'm still delayed, but uh... Um, I'll ask the next question. I'll put it up on the screen. Let me take that one down, put this one up. This is from Dioni. He says, do you still visit Syria? Well, so going back to the question that was asked earlier, I couldn't go to Syria because it was too dangerous. Um, and so I had to do the research differently, which was with Ibrahim, meeting him every week for an hour and a half. And I don't know, could the quick, because she said, do you still visit Syria? Could she be asking, do I still visit Cyprus? I don't know. If that's if that was the question, then yes, I do still visit Cyprus. But in terms of Syria, I couldn't go at all because it was too dangerous at the time. So I had to find another way to, to immerse myself and to do the research and to understand, how, you know, as much as I could about what the characters would have been through. Mm. Any more questions, Jen, from some of our viewers? I don't know if she can hear us, you know. <laughs> can I she? don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Jen, 
again? I don't, I don't think she can hear us. No, I don't think she can hear us. Um, okay, cool. We've got oh, a third oh, question. Oh. Augustine set in story she was told. And about other scenes set in Syria oh. based on stories you were told about how people were treated. Yes, so they they were. So the stories, the scenes set in Syria were all um, loosely based. I, on I think I'm. Uh, I don't. Yeah, shall I just answer it? Yeah. <laughs> So, so the scenes that were set in Syria were all based on, loosely based on stories that I'd heard. And some of them had come from Ibrahim while we, would, while we were doing the lessons every week. But I interviewed so many people. I spoke to so many people. Um, some people I spoke to while I was in Athens. And there were lots of people that I met in the UK and interviewed here as well. Um, I also spoke to lots of people who had worked as volunteers as well. Um, they worked in volunte as volunteers in different parts of Greece and they'd heard stories too. So I had such an array of kind of um, information from people that had already made it to the UK, from others that I'd met in Athens mm -hmm. and from volunteers themselves as well. And also the experiences in the camps um, and visiting the camps as well. So all of those contributed to the stories that developed in the novel. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, um, I wanted to also ask um, if you are still doing refugee work in the UK or outside the UK, um, or if that was an experience, I think that you felt that you were so immersed and that you had to also let go. I mean, there is something that they do talk about in terms of fatigue that you do get after being in those situations. And I did really, I did. I mean, what I did, there was a little project that I was doing with the Open Cultural Centre in Thessaloniki, which was we were mm -hmm. wanted to collect, and there are some on my website, to collect real life stories from children and their experiences of making it to Greece. So if you wanted to have a look at that, so that was, oh. yeah, so it's on my, it's on the website, the beekeeper of okay. And it's, um, there's, I think at the moment, I think there's about three stories on there. So this was a, a little project of getting children really to tell their stories. Mm. Um, the other thing that I've been doing is going around the country and various other places talking about refugees and the experience of working with refugees. Mm. So although I haven't been doing voluntary work since, I've been doing a lot of kind of raising awareness. I've been doing projects in schools where I go into schools and do a, a workshop that's about refugee stories to try and get children to understand the experiences of others basically and the yeah. things that some people go through and it's all about mm. developing understanding and empathy and empathy yeah exactly and this sort of thing so that's really what i've been doing but i do i would like to go back to greece and do more work with the hope center um mm. hope center in athens victoria square so I'm, I'm hoping to do that at some point but you're right i did have i was absolutely emotionally i don't know you know you know, some of my colleagues that work there constantly mm. at the centre, I, sometimes I don't know how they do it because no. I was emotionally exhausted when I came back. I, I'm really in awe of them for being able to work there for so many years and keep the place going. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, but it's really good to hear um, how the story is evolving and how readers are keeping it alive and you're keeping it alive with all these interactions. Yeah. So that's of all the time we have for today oh that's lovely thank you um, it was lovely to talk to you christy everyone please make sure you get your hands on the beekeeper of aleppo you can order it online from loot take a lot any south african retailers it's in the book and when the shops open again um you can definitely get in the shops it's obviously also on amazon in the kindle store um, all the links will be in the description box below and also on our website. It's an incredibly moving um, and really well-written book. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you today, Christy. It's been lovely speaking to you. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good Bye. evening. Bye. 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 Are we still on?
Uh, I'm waiting for her to take us off the air.